All right, if we could turn, please, again to the book of Ruth and the third chapter, Ruth chapter three, and I'm going to begin reading at verse three, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. And we're going to be thinking about Ruth at the feet of Boaz, Ruth at the feet of Boaz. So it says, verse three, wash thyself therefore and anoint thee and put thy raiment upon thee and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. And she went down unto the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry. He went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn, and she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth thine handmaid. Spread, therefore, thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning. Inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman. Howbeit, there is a kinsman nearer than I. Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning, that if he will perform unto thee the part of kinsman well, let him do the kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee, and the Lord, as the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. And she lay at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before one could know another. And he said, Let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. Also, he said, Bring the veil that thou hast upon thee, and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley, and laid it on her, and she went unto the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done to her. And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me. For he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Then said she, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. For the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. And again, God always blesses the reading of his precious word to us. If in chapter two, we were uh, in the field of Boaz and there was much labor. Some have suggested that chapter two is the Martha chapter, uh, busy uh, about the master's business. Uh, certainly, it, it was that kind of a chapter. But chapter three has been well uh, said to be the Mary chapter. This is the chapter of being at his feet. And both are necessary. We do need to labor in the field, but we also need to learn uh, what it is to be at the feet of our heavenly Boaz. And so often, we can be so activity orientated that we're not spending the time at his feet. And we certainly should be doing that. And so we read uh, in verse three, it says, wash thyself therefore and anoint thee and put thy raiment upon thee and get thee down to the floor, but make not thyself known to the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. Of course, this is the instructions of Naomi. 
uh, to go to the to the threshing floor and to prepare herself to to get in the right condition uh, to be there at his feet. Now, just a couple of additional comments about the threshing floor. We mentioned the threshing floor last week has been quite significant. Uh, it, it's a process of elimination. The threshing floor, uh, chaff has to be to be removed. Uh, finding rest, uh, things need to be eliminated if we're to truly find rest at His feet, and and certainly uh, we we think of the fact that the Lord Jesus is also one day going to do a great winnowing work. He's going to separate the wheat from the chaff in this world, isn't he? Just as Boaz is doing that work. And just a couple of references that I think are very significant. Psalm 1, Psalm 1 and verse 4, a very uh, familiar passage to all of us. We're, we're aware of Psalm 1, that blessed man. But it says, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. And certainly the Lord Jesus is going to, in the coming day, sort the wheat from the chaff. Uh, look at the Gospel of Luke just to, to see uh, how that is going to take place. This is the words of John Baptizer as he prophesies concerning the Lord Jesus and his coming ministry. And in Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, in verse 17. It simply says this, uh, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. And it is interesting that we find here Boaz, he himself, now he's had other people being involved in reaping the harvest, but the actual work of the the threshing floor and the winnowing is the work that he himself will do because he alone is the only one who can uh, separate clearly uh, the wheat from the chaff. Uh, certainly uh, we know the enemy has sown tares. We know that. And certainly the, uh, you, it's hard to tell whose wheat and whose tares only the Lord can really make that identification. And so he is the one that's going to do that. And certainly it's good to know, isn't it, that the Lord knows exactly how to remove the chaff from our lives. And uh, we, we certainly need to allow him, as it were, to put us through the winnowing floor so that anything that is chaff in our lives is removed. We want to be purged of, of the chaff and, and certainly put in a, a right condition uh, to enjoy uh, fruitful lives for the Lord. So the instructions for her to get ready. Naomi gives Ruth instructions how to prepare herself to, to go to lie at his feet. It's obvious Naomi desires that Ruth should make herself especially presentable for what she has in mind. And of course, every believer should approach the presence of the Redeemer, because remember, he is that kinsman Redeemer, uh, the, 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 the beloved one, uh, with due and suitable reverence, and in the beauty of holiness and modesty. And so again, if we're going to come into his presence, we need to make sure that we're properly prepared. And so what did she have to do? Well, she had to remove the mourning garment she had been wearing because all of Moab's cloth had to be removed. <laughs> Garments of the old country had to be gone. Uh, and we're told, aren't we, put off the old man. Uh, and the the language of put off the old man is put it off like a dirty shirt, you know, that it's just absolutely filthy. Put it off and throw it away. And so uh, certainly we need to remove Moab's clothing. And so he's told, uh, she's told to wash, first of all. And again, we, we think of being clean spiritually. We think of how important it is to have our sins confessed. If we're going to go sit at his feet, uh, we want to be in a right condition uh, to, to learn from him at his feet. And holiness of life is so important. The verse that has been very instrumental, very challenging in my own life, just this, this desire for greater holiness of life, 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1, and a verse I often use 
uh, in connection with correspondence, because I don't, I don't think we take this uh, as seriously as, as we ought. But in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1, we're told that, that we're to purge ourselves of certain things. And so he says, and it's in the light of the great promises of chapter 6, it says, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. To be, to be clean spiritually, to remove uh, both physically uh, dirt and also uh, uh, attitude dirt in our lives. Um, remove everything that is offensive to him. Come in that place of being cleansed and come to cleansing. And of course, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So she's told to wash. And then she's she's told not only uh, to, to, to do the washing, uh, wash thyself therefore, and then it says, anoint thee. And of course, that speaks of the anointing oil, doesn't it? And of course, it speaks of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And isn't it wonderful to know that the scripture tells us in 1 John 2, 20, that we, we have the anointing, uh, that one of the wonderful things about being a child of God is that we have the Holy Spirit. But again, we all uh, had some correspondence with a brother last night, and he was perplexed about this issue of the Holy Spirit. And, and a simple answer is every believer has the Holy Spirit. Because if he doesn't, he's not one of his. However, does the Holy Spirit have all of us? Are we fully yielded to him? And so we certainly need that anointing oil. And so he says, or she says, uh, that she is to wash and then anoint thee with oil. And then it says, and put thy raiment upon thee. Just as she had to put off the, the mourning garments connected with Moab and her old life, she now has to put on new raiment, new garments. And just as we're told to put off the old man, we're told to put on uh, the new man. Uh, look at Colossians chapter 3, just beautiful scriptures uh, that um, would address this need of us uh, putting on this new man. Colossians 3 uh, verse 12, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And so this idea of putting off. And then also uh, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 24. Again, a similar idea of this putting on Ephesians 4.24, where we read this, and ye that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And so we could say it's this idea of put on the new man, put on Christ. Um, and so it says that this is how she would was to attire herself before she went to lay at his feet. And then notice it says, again, at the end of verse three, uh, it says, and get thee down to the floor, but make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. So she's got to wait until he's done eating and drinking. What was he eating and what was he drinking? Uh, again, tip typically, we want to just think about this. What, the, what he had to eat and what he had to drink, our heavenly Boaz was there was a bitter cup that he had to to drink right uh, he he had to nobody else could do that he he had to drink that bitter cup alone and he had to drink down the dark dregs and so and of course we're so thankful he did that he said uh, the cup that my father has given me to drink shall I not drink it and of course the Lord Jesus uh, is in, in this picture typified laying down after a finished work, after having drunk the cup, have, having done all that was required of him, he, he lays down in the good of a finished work. And we sit at his feet, the one who has done this marvelous finished work. We sit at his feet and we learn of him. 
So now verse four, and it says, it shall be when he lieth down that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie and, and thou shalt go in and cover his feet and lay thee down and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. So she has to get down, get down on the floor. Boaz lying down in the light of a finished work. And of course, he'd done the threshing and all the rest of it. The work was done. And she now is to lie down. She's to take that place of humility, to get down low, to be humble at his feet. And it, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, we're going to see in chapter three that it's going to be more productive for her laying at his feet than it was even laboring in the field. It's going to actually be more productive in terms of not only the grain she carries away, but also the promises that she receives laying at his feet. And sometimes I think in the work of God, a lot more would be accomplished if we were less activity driven and we spent more time at the feet of the master, laying down on his feet in that place of the, the, the suppliant, of, of, the, of the humble one laying at the master's feet, seeking blessing and grace from him. Uh, we get much more accomplished. And it's not, I'm not saying we don't need to labor in the fields. Oh, brothers, we need to labor in the field of Boaz. That is, there's no question about that. But we also, we need to learn to be both Mary and Martha, serving and sitting at the feet we need both and so often our busy society it's 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 so everything's measured by activity everything and yet the lord is not measuring according to that measure what he is interested in is a person who will truly be like mary devoted to him sitting at his feet learning and drinking in uh, from him and so she's going to benefit tremendously. And so verse five, it's, she said unto her, all that thou sayest unto me, I will do. Isn't Ruth so delightful? Isn't it just wonderful to see somebody who is so trusting of her mother-in-law's advice, always commendable, always willing uh, to be guided by the older woman and to do what she tells her. And we need this. It's interesting how Titus talks about the older women uh, uh, teaching the younger women. And, and firstly, we need all the women who can do that. But we also need younger women who are teachable, who want to be taught, who don't think they know everything. And certainly Ruth is a beautiful example of one who is willing to be instructed and guided by the older sister and will clearly do what she asks us to do. And so it's a very delightful thing uh, when you get that. And of course, isn't it a delightful combination, I think, when you have an older, more mature saint and a younger saint, and they're together in harness, one learning from the other, wisdom of years, and then youthful energy put together. It's a beautiful combination. And certainly we see that. And so she, she says she would do whatever uh, was uh, instructed her all that thou sayest unto me i will do and wouldn't it be wonderful if we had the same attitude as that towards the lord lord all that thou sayest to me i will do <laughs> i was talking to some brethren this morning and what what we observed was from acts chapter one the things that jesus began to do and teach <laughs> and what we find is so often um, in our situation, we teach and we don't do, but the Lord began to do and teach. And certainly it's a wonderful thing uh, to see Ruth's willingness. All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. Such a, co a compliant, uh, willing spirit. And she's going to be blessed for that. And so verse six, she went down into the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her so there she is carrying out to the exact instructions that had been given to her by the mother-in-law no deviation uh, no uh, 
in, in, uh, of her own initiative. She just does everything that her mother-in-law tells her to do. And verse seven, and when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn and she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. I want to think about several things here. First of all, it says his heart was merry. And we, we don't want to get the wrong idea here about his heart being merry. Um, first of all, uh, it's not implying any sense of uh, drunken merriment or inebriation whatsoever. It simply means he was cheerfully satisfied at the work that he had accomplished. Uh, he was pleased with his work. He was pleased with the meal and could rest contented with his heart at ease. In fact, the phrase merry is found in verse one, uh, where at the end of verse one of chapter three, it says, shall I not seek rest for thee that it may be well with thee? And it really is this idea of that it may be well with thee. And so he, he's feeling a sense of what we'd say today, the feel good factor. Uh, there's a sense of well-being. He's, he's finished the work. And he has enjoyed the meal, and now he is laying down at the end of uh, or in the good of that finished work. Now, why does he have to lay down at the heap of corn again contextually? Remember, we're in the days of judges still. And in the days of judges, there was much political and social instability in the land of Israel. And it wasn't unusual for gangs of thieves to come and steal all the hard-earned grain uh, a farmer had grown. So Boaz slept at the threshing floor uh, to guard his crop against the attacks that are described in the next chapter, for instance, our next book, 1 Samuel 23, verse 1. You get an example of what I'm talking about. 1 Samuel 23, in verse one, it says, then they told David, saying, behold, the Philistines fight against Kyla, and they rob the threshing floors. Okay, uh, you see that a little bit of uh, when Gideon, you know, was was threshing the wheat in the wine press, and he's trying to protect uh, from the, the raiders that were coming in and stealing his goods. So these are still unstable days. And so uh, Boaz is there protecting his crop against attacks and those that would like to steal by the way isn't it wonderful that our lord jesus is protecting his harvest too <laughs> that uh, nobody will steal or kill or destroy those which belong to him he protects his flock and cares for them as that perfect shepherd so this idea of laying down at his feet uh, which we see here, uh, and um, the idea of, uh, just as it describes it here, uncovering his feet and laying her down. It was understood really as an act of total submission in the culture of that day. Uh, in that day, it was understood to be the role of a servant to lay at their master's feet and be ready for any command of the master. So when Naomi told Ruth, lie down at Boaz's feet, she told her to come to him in a totally humble and submissive way. Can't lose sight of the bigger picture. And that is that <clears throat> Ruth came to claim a right here. Okay. Boaz was her goel, right? Her kinsman redeemer. That word goel, we said it's translated three different ways in the Old Testament. It's, it's kinsman. Is translated redeemer. For instance, Job, I know that my redeemer liveth. I know that my goel liveth. <laughs> That's the word. Uh, and it's also the word avenger, as in terms of the avenger of blood. And it's interesting that the Lord Jesus will fulfill all those three roles. Uh, he, he would literally come and, and we'll see in more detail. He will become our kinsman. He'll become made like unto his brethren, that he might be our redeemer but he also will be the avenger. He will deal with the one 
who has brought such destruction and devastation and poverty to this world. And the Lord will fulfill all of those, but we'll think more of that in the next chapter. So here she is. <clears throat> She's laying down at the feet of her Goel and her kinsman redeemer. And she did have the right to expect him to marry her and raise up a family uh, to perpetuate the name of Elimelech. But Naomi wisely counseled Ruth to not come to him as a victim demanding her rights, but as a humble servant, trusting in the goodness of her kinsman redeemer. She lays down there and what she's saying is, I respect you, I trust you, and I will put my fate in your hands. Verse eight, it says, and it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. This is quite the amazing scene. Boaz was indeed startled. I think that would be the way you would want to translate this. Waking up in the night as he turned in his sleep, knowing that someone was out there, but not being able to see clearly because of the darkness, the sleep being in his eyes. Remember, he's there to protect, protect against thieves. It must have been quite a shock to wake up and know that someone was there. But his shock tur turned quickly to wondering when he found out the visitor was a woman. And notice it's, it's midnight when he wakes. It came to pass at midnight, the midnight hour. And what's interesting is that before the next midnight, <laughs> she would be his wife. The inheritance would be secured. More would be done in one night at his feet than all day working in the harvest field. And I think, again, we just need to keep this thought in our minds that, that in our assembly activity, and again, we don't want to take away from serving faithfully the Lord in the confines of the local assembly and evangelistic labors, but if we could spend more time at the feet of the master, much more would be accomplished. And notice at the darkest hour, this is midnight, is when she's going to receive the promise. She's in the right position at his feet as a suppliant. She's in the right place, uh, in that place of humility. And she's at the, the feet of the right person, the one who can affect deliverance for her and for Naomi and for all of their ills and their difficulties. And again, what a wonderful thing it is for us to learn to be at his feet. And notice in verse nine, and he said, who art thou? She answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid, spread therefore thy skirt, <clears throat> excuse me, over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. So spread your skirt. Now, she just means the flap or the corner of his covering. Uh, it, it's really the extremities of it. It's occasionally it's translated as wing. In fact, even in this very book in chapter two and verse 12, uh, the same uh, Hebrew word is translated when it says in chapter two, verse 12, the Lord recompense thy work and in full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. And so that's the same word that's involved here, uh, unto whose wings you've come to trust. So the idea of, of spread your skirt upon me is, you know that I've trusted in the God of Israel, but now I am trusting in you to affect my deliverance, to be my kinsman redeemer. And so she really is. She's already put a trust in the Lord God of Israel, but now she's saying to Boaz, I need your protection. I need you to be my kinsman redeemer, for you're a near kinsman to me. Now, I just want to just kind of jump off a little bit on this idea of the outer extremities, like the wing or the, the end of the skirt. And it is interesting. Do you remember the woman that had an issue of blood for 12 years. And in Matthew's gospel, in chapter 9 and verse 20, 
she 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 makes this a kind of remarkable statement and i believe it showed tremendous faith on her part uh, i believe that she knew that he was the messiah of israel and the only hope for her in her plight uh, chapter 9 of matthew verse 20 behold a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment for she said within herself if it, I may be, but touch his garment, I will, I shall be whole. <laughs> and of course, the Lord doesn't disappoint. Jesus turned about him, and when he saw her, she said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. And I believe that what you've got here is a delightful picture. And I want us to just look at the book of Malachi. Just go back to Malachi, just back from Matthew in chapter 4 and verse 2. And I wonder, was this in her mind as she reached out to touch the garment? Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall and i think it's a beautiful picture isn't it those those outer garments just like the wings say the, the same hebrew word is used for both and it's a place of healing a place of protection and of course uh, the son of righteousness with healing in his wings and so she is saying i want you to be my protection i want you to be my kinsman redeemer to to be my husband, uh, to claim the inheritance, all of these things. She's asking for this. Just a, another example where this idea of the spreading the skirt has the idea of taking in, in marriage is if Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 8. Ezekiel 16, verse 8, it says, Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. Speaking of God's relationship with his people, with his ancient people, that again, what did he do? He, he spread his skirt upon them. He went entered into a covenant relationship with them. And so she is saying, would you enter into a covenant relationship with me to be my kinsman redeemer, uh, to take that role as my goal? And so verse 10, she said, blessed be thou of the Lord, my, sorry, he said, now this is Boaz's response. Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. Boaz now begins to give some very generous praise to Ruth. And particularly, he's going to praise two things, her fidelity, particularly to her mother-in-law, Naomi, and then her chastity, that she wasn't running after other men. And so, oh, by the way, maybe I, I skip one thing that before we go into that in the previous verse. Notice when, she, when he said, who art thou, in verse 9, she answered and said, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Well, you'd notice that. Previously, she's always been Ruth the Moabitess. But she doesn't call herself Ruth the Moabitess now, does she? She says, I'm Ruth, thine handmaid. Um, he had, in chapter 2, verse 13, <clears throat> it says, Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for thou hast comforted me, for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid though I be not like one of thine handmaidens. And so she, she now is not referring to what she used to be, but she's appealing to him on the basis of what, what she 
has become because of his grace and kindness to her. Not what she used to be, but what he has made her through grace. She's not just Ruth the Moabitess now, but she's Ruth, his handmaid. And so that's how she appeals to him. But again, when we come to the Lord, let's remember we're not coming based on what we used to be because we had no claims upon him based on what we used to be. But we do have claims upon him now because of what we are through grace. And we can come and we can ask petitions from him. So he responds by praising her. Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter. He speaks to her uh, like a father to a daughter in a very kind manner. And he indicates her fidelity and her chastity. And uh, it would show that perhaps he is much older than her, perhaps in advanced years. So he's saying to her, you've given tremendous proof of your piety. You've avoided the young. Uh, you know, she's a young widow. Uh, she's been working in the fields, lots of opportunities there, because remember, there were lots of young men laboring in the fields. And she could have been flirtatious if she had so chosen to be, but she didn't. And so instead of flirting after those her own age, she actually now comes to an elderly man, a much older man, and yet for the purpose of having the divine injunction fulfilled. This idea of the leveret marriage, the, the brother or next of kin who might take the wife of the deceased and raised up uh, an, uh, uh, an ancestor to, to the dead relative, to the one who had died childless, that his, might, his name might not become extinct in Israel. And this is, again, great proof of her piety as far as he is concerned. And no doubt uh, she was a a pretty young woman, and uh, and yet here she is, uh, just wanting to do the right thing biblically in every way. Uh, and so he commends her for this and for her uh, not being a flirtatious woman. It's interesting, too, that um, both Boaz and Ruth, and we want to stress this, some of the more modern commenta commentators this idea of laying at his feet, covering with his skirt. They've tried almost to read 20th century or 21st century culture into this story and almost made it to be something that is uh, inappropriate that's going on here. Let's just remind ourselves, this man was a man of valor or a man of virtue. He's well-respected. He, he's not any way a dirty old man. Let's get that out of our minds of modern people reading our culture into this stuff. He's not that at all. And she is a virtuous woman. And, and so there's nothing inappropriate about this. Uh, she, she, she's coming. Uh, she's doing the right thing. She's appealing all of these things. Uh, let's just be sure about this. This is all above board. This is very appropriate. Of course, he uh, being... Uh, in that position, he could have um, taken advantage, but he didn't because, again, he's a man of valor or a man of integrity. She, it's also interesting that it shows something about Ruth that it's not so much her attraction to Boaz based on his image or his appearance, but out of respect for who he is. And sadly, many today fall in love with someone who has an image or an appearance rather than a person who can really be respected. And certainly this man was a man who could be re re respected. And it is an amazing request, really. A, a Jewish man, uh, <clears throat> well-respected, is being asked by a Moabites girl to to basically to marry her and to be the kinsman redeemer and again faith is reaching out its greatest claim and grace is responding willingly because verse 11 notice it says and now my daughter fear not i will do to thee all 
that thou requirest for all the city of the people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman and so a promise is made all that thou requestest i'll do and then he makes this statement all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman isn't it amazing what a reputation ruth had gained since her ar arrival from moab that everyone now in the city of bethlehem all had come to the same conclusion by observing her piety and certainly her fidelity to her mother-in-law and her piety of conduct her chastity they all came to the same conclusion you are a virtuous woman what a tremendous thing to have that kind of reputation and the scripture has a lot to say about being a virtuous woman uh, the book of proverbs of course a couple of very familiar passages that talk about the 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 great blessing of being a virtuous woman proverbs 12 verse 4 a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones and so a, a virtuous woman enhances the the stature and the reputation of a, a man if she has if he has a virtuous woman to be his wife she enhances his stature it's like a crown uh, upon his head uh, it, it makes him look much more dignified and much more uh, 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 valued because of a virtuous woman and then of course we're all very familiar with the book of proverbs chapter 31 verse 10 who can find a virtuous woman her price is far above rubies you cannot calculate the value of a virtuous woman notice verse 23 her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land so we're going to see more about the gates. He's kind of uh, one of the leaders of the city. He's part of the uh, the hierarchy, the, the judges of the city. He's known in the gates. Now, I'm reading that because I want you to read from verse 28 now of chapter 31. It says, "Many do uh, no, her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own work praise her in the gates. So a husband's known in the gates, but the virtuous woman will also be known in the gates as well. Her own work will praise her. And so here, certainly, uh, Ruth is recognized by all with one consent that she is a virtuous woman and it's a wonderful thing to have such a reputation now i want you to notice verse 12 it says and now it is true that i am thy near kinsman how be it there is a kinsman nearer than i almost like a a kind of a big letdown in the story here now everything's moving along so fine and then all of a sudden ah but there's a problem <laughs> and there is a problem and that is that there's another kinsman who is closer. And so, although Boaz was recognized as her Goel towards Ruth, there was a Goel who was closer. And Boaz could not exercise his right as kinsman redeemer unless his closer kinsman redeemer relinquished his rights towards Ruth. So he, he's willing to extend grace to Ruth but not at the expense of righteousness. Everything must be done correctly. And the Lord Jesus, when he extended grace to us, he made sure that it was done in a way that all righteousness was dealt with as well. Uh, it wasn't a case of just showing grace to us and, and ignoring the righteous requirements that were against us. And that's the wonderful truth about the gospel, isn't it? That it, 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 on the one hand, allows God to be both just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. That all righteousness is dealt with because our sin was paid for. Every penny, uh, every ounce of debt was paid in full at the cross. And his grace towards us 
is is not cutting any corners it's in accordance with absolute righteousness and so he's not willing to cut corners he, he he's willing to play this part of the kinsman redeemer but everything must be done decently and in order to be accepted and in a proper way and so she he says to her tarry this night and it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto thee the part of kinsman well let him do the kinsman's part but if he will not do the part of the kinsman to thee then will i do the part of a kinsman to thee as the lord liveth lie down until the morning again it tells as much about the virtue of both of them that they were alone together in the threshing floor in the night hours and yet remained pure and filled with integrity an old uh, anglican bishop bishop hall said this boaz instead of touching her as a wanton blesseth her as a father encourageth her as a friend promises her as a kinsman rewards her as a patron and sends her away laden with hopes and gifts no less chaste more happy than she came and it's a wonderful thing to think about this boaz also is going to give a pledge to her she's not going to go back empty notice in verse 14 she laid his feet until the morning and she rose up before one could know another and he said let it not be known that a woman came into the floor and so first of all we, we notice his precaution that is seen here uh, he's concerned about her reputation um, he, he wants to make sure that she leaves the floor while it's still dark before there's to eliminate any gossip any scandal there's always evil minds abroad in every town who would want to speak falsehood and create slander and the reputation of both must be protected and so he says let it not be known that a woman uh, lay on the fleshing floor and it's interesting too isn't it that that for us as believers not only should we not be involved in evil but we should put off all appearance of evil, not even give the suggestion or the hint of it that we, there must be the highest integrity in our conduct. And we need to make sure that not we don't give any occasion for evil minds to gossip and to run around with stories <laughs> uh, that are not true. He assures her as the Lord liveth that he is going to go about this business and to make it of the utmost importance the end of verse 13 as the lord liveth lie down until the morning that phrase is used 72 times in the old testament and it really it, it, it's uh, it's calling on god for uh to it's saying that that he, he's going to do this in the sight of god he's going to fulfill her request and go, give it the utmost importance then verse 15 also he said bring the veil that thou hast upon thee and hold it and when she had held it he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her and she went into the city so this is the pledge that he gives her he's not going to send her back empty to a mother-in-law he's going to send her with six measures of meal now several things about this six measures of meal and the veil first of all I'm told that six measures of meal is two ephahs. Remember at the end of her toil, when she went home, having labored in the field, she took an ephah measure with her. <laughs> now, sitting at his feet, now that was all day toiling in the field. She got one ephah. All night sitting at his feet, she gets double the blessing two ephahs worth isn't that interesting uh, and, and again could we see more blessing if we spent more time in his presence seeking his blessing at his feet and then why six measures i mean if this is the perfect man why don't he give us seven measures <laughs> you know six uh six is number of man but six you see is interesting because this is a pledge it, it when he says go with six 
What comes after six? In the week, what comes after six days? Day seven. What is day seven? It's the day Sabbath. It's rest. She is going to come into rest. <laughs> this is a pledge. He's given her the six, the seven, the rest is coming. The days of work and toil were done. Rest is about to be granted. By the way, it's a good job that she was wearing a proper veil. Imagine if she'd have been wearing a micro covering. You know, these symbols of symbols, you know what they are, you know, the doilies. No way she could have carried six measures of meal if she'd have been wearing a symbol of a symbol. But she has a proper veil and she can carry six measures home to a mother-in-law. Notice verse 16. It says, when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, who art thou my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done to her. Why does she say, who are you, my daughter? Don't she know who she is? Of course she does. But I think what she's asking is, has your circumstances changed? Are you still that widow from Moab? Or do you now have a proposal? Are things changing for you? Are you still just Ruth the Moabite as the widow of Marlon? Or are you now the betrothed wife of Boaz? That's why she's saying, who art thou, my daughter? And he told her all that the man had done to her. And she said, these six measures of barley gave he me. For he said to me, go not empty to thy mother-in-law. Interesting that when Naomi came back, in chapter 1, verse 21, she says, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Now Boaz makes sure that she doesn't go home empty to your mother-in-law. You see, what's about to happen is this, that the days of emptiness are about to end. And they're going to be replaced with days of fullness. Not only has she got six measures of, of barley, Soon her hands, Naomi's hands, are going to be full of something else, full of a, a baby in which all the future hopes of the family lineage uh, will be fulfilled. Oh, yes, she's going to end up with much fullness. And isn't it wonderful that when we sit at his feet, one of the things that we, we can say is this, it's a place where we can know something of his fullness, of his fullness have we all received grace upon grace. And isn't it great to come and receive of his fullness? And so wonderful thing about our heavenly Boaz is that he giveth much more. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Oh, how wonderful to be at the feet of a God who giveth much more. And then verse 18 then said she, sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. But the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. Sit still, my daughter. There's nothing more that could be done. It's all now in the hands of the Redeemer. He, if the work's going to be done, he has to do it. But you know, isn't it the hardest thing for all of us? to sit still and just to rest and to wait upon the Lord. How the flesh loves to be on the move. The flesh is restless. The flesh doesn't like to sit still. We're, we, we want to be, to be doing and to be at a place of sitting still and allowing the Lord to work. That's a very hard thing. For us to do. Ruth must rest, but while she's resting, Boaz will not rest. The man will not be in rest until he's finished the thing this day. One of the joys of studying together last week on the great day of atonement is that it was a day of rest. No work was to be done on fear of death, but one man he hardly stopped. He was working all the time. 
right? Everybody else had to just rest, not do any work. And it was all dependent on the one man doing all the work. And isn't that how we're going to be in glory? It's when we got to the place where we ceased trying to establish our own righteousness. We, we ceased working and we, we completely sat still and we depended in the delivering work of another one who did all the work on our behalf. Jane Darby says this, yes, yet it must be thy love had not its rest. Were thy redeemed not with thee fully blessed. That love that gives not as the world, but shares all it possesses with its loved co-heirs. Yes, there is a time to sit still. Ruth 3.18. There's a time to be still. Psalm 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. There's a time to stand still, Exodus 14, 13. Stand still and see the deliverance of the Lord. May God encourage our hearts as we, as we are encouraged to lay at the feet of Boaz, who has finished the work, and just to be at his feet and to learn of him. What a place that is, and a place of fruitfulness and blessing. Help us, Lord, our flesh is restless. Help us to learn to sit at thy feet. Amen.